Exodus chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Say amen when you're there. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. You can get along with your in-laws. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. He was at the back of the desert. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold the bush burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. You can be on fire without being consumed. And those apostolics in this place probably just got a little inkling where I'm going. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight. What you're seeing in some people today, I hope, catches your attention. There's going to church, and then there's living for God. They are two entirely different things. There are believers, and then there are followers. Two entirely different things. Are you, are you with me this morning? So Moses made the decision to turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. They're on fire. It's on fire. But it's not consumed. I have found in church, it mesmerizes and amazes people. When they watch people get on fire for God and give everything to God and they still continue on. Stingy people look and say, wait a minute, I'm not giving this, but how come they got more God than I do? Making it plain here. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, see, curiosity doesn't always kill the cat. You're welcome. That was free. You know who that was for. <laughs> God called to him. See, when the curiosity got his attention, God gave him a word. And from the midst of the bush, he said, Moses, Moses. It's a good thing when God calls your name. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. You got to take them sandals. You got to take them shoes off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. This is one of the first times we hear about holy. Put your Bibles down. I'm going to read some more scripture, but I want to stop here and allow you to be seated. We're going to pray first. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We ask for knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, but we desperately need revelation. Serving you, Lord, is different than anything else on the planet. And sadly, a lot of places that are called places of worship or churches are omitting this very important attribute of living for God. Not I'm but dust, I'm but clay, I'm just a man. I need your help, your unction, your anointing. I need the Holy Ghost. I, I need your words and your thoughts. I need your ways and not mine. Help me to decrease that you could increase, Lord, today that I could truly help these people that you love. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 is called the faith chapter for those of you that are new and don't know. It says, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. They weren't worried about what happened to them. They were going to give their child to God. I hope you caught that. They were rewarded in verse 24 by a child that made a decision. A lot of people recognize the place of the decision, but don't understand the difference between being a believer and a real follower. 
Because by faith, when by faith, Moses, when he became of age, when it was his choice, not mom's, not dad's, his, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was changing directions. John the Baptist was an important figure in New Testament writings. Though his life was short-lived, he made a very important statement concerning New Testament salvation that was being implemented and what Jesus was coming to do. And he made a, an important statement that you should have highlighted in your Bible or at least know its existence in Matthew 3 and 11. Because he said, I indeed baptize you. And if you know Acts chapter 19, one of the disciples had to deal with some people that had only been baptized by John and were missing the plan of salvation. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. Talking about shoes again. <laughs> he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fire is important. Fire is symbolic. And I want you to remember that as we get into our lesson this morning. Moses was divinely appointed. If you've lived any length of time, um, Hollywood has attempted to portray this story. Songs have been written. But I still think I'll just stick with what the Bible says. And I believe that we can all glean from this and as though we're here with other people, God has a plan for your life. I do not believe that anybody is here by mistake. I believe right now, God, Almighty God, your creator, wants to talk to you about something today. I believe Moses, despite everything we know about him, the ups and downs, the vicissitudes, the struggles, the mistakes, Moses was appointed, divinely appointed for a specific time and place in history. I believe that about you and I as well. Despite the trouble, the issues that you face right now, I still fully believe, like Moses, you're divinely appointed for such a time as this. I believe there's a purpose the world would have you do. There's a purpose that you might get caught up doing, but I believe God has a purpose for you if you'll surrender to him. So I want to talk for a few minutes about the powerful place called surrender, which is only, only kind of oxymoronic for us. Wait a minute. Surrender seems like a weak place to the world, but in God, it's a powerful place. God ordained both the birth and preservation of Moses. And like you, God had a purpose. No one is here by accident. You're not a product of chance. And though I've heard it said about children, no one is a mistake. You did not just happen to be born into a mess that you were born into. God had his hand on your life from the very moment of conception. Try to stay with me. God used Egypt to preserve Moses. God used Pharaoh's household to preserve Moses. Stay with me. It was God's divine foresight that Moses ended up in Pharaoh's house. It was Pharaoh's house that decreed to kill all them babies. But God in his way said, watch this. <laughs> Not only am I going to raise one up, but I'm going to raise the deliverer up right under the nose of the one trying to kill him. I'm telling you, get ready. God wants to do something amazing in your life. <laughs> Moses was educated by the Egyptians. It's easy to get distraught with our educational system today, but God's still bigger. It was Egypt that taught him the finer arts of warfare and life and society. It was Egypt that taught him his conduct and his behavior. 
But listen closely to me. Even with the finest education and all that Egypt had to offer and all that Egypt handed him, all those limited resources, talking about a man being raised up in home at the time where they built pyramids. I was joking around with someone the other day, some of the men in the church, listen, guys, we have all this at our disposal to do this. Surely we can do this if at the time of Moses they built the pyramids without all, all what we have, right? But despite all that Egypt had to offer, Egypt could not produce the man that God needed. Hear me again. The world will not produce in you the person God needs you to be. Egypt may have preserved him, but Egypt could not prepare him. Hear me. The wisdom of Egypt, as profound as it was, the science of Egypt, as advanced as it was, the culture of Egypt, as refined as it was, listen to me, none of it could produce the kind of person God needed. I come to remind you, your Egyptian or secular qualifications are not going to be enough. You can go and hit the gym and be all kind of buffed as you want to be. Ain't going to be enough. You can make all kinds of money and get all kinds of pats on the back. People think oh, it ain't going to be enough. You can have PhDs that will fill the whole wall of a building. It's not going to be enough to qualify you to be used of God. Remember, if you're going to tout your credentials in the kingdom of God, it's not a PhD, it's G-O-D. Egypt cannot produce a man of God. Your resume in the world, your bank account, your house, your cars, all the stuff that the world looks at ain't going to build a man of God, ain't going to build a lady of God. Egypt cannot produce a child of God. So from the very word go, the influence of Egypt was tainted. The ways of Egypt and its war against the ways of God, the wisdom of Egypt, is foolishness in the eyes of God. You can point to your successes of Egypt as a qualification, but you're going to find yourself woefully short, unfit to be God's person. As great as Moses might have felt or thought, from his fine education or his wealth, there had to come a place where Moses was separated from Egypt. There comes a time, if you're ever going to go where God wants to take you, if you're ever going to be where God wants to be, you are going to have to separate yourself from Egypt. He could not accomplish the purpose and plan of God as an Egyptian. Your, your, your identity is going to have to change. You, you may want to tout it. You may want to shout it. But you can't do for God until you do without it. Moses knew he had a purpose. Remember the story. He knew he was called. He had enough sense to know that he was not really an Egyptian. Oh, he looked like one. He dressed like one. He acted like one. He had all the stuff of one. He could point, look at me, I'm a prince of Egypt. You could be a prince of this world. And that's where it stops. The story of his life in Egypt demonstrates a fatal flaw in his thinking. It shows us the flaws in our thinking. You may have done well in Egypt, but an Egyptian can't give you what you need in God's kingdom. But apparently Moses thought he could affect change from within Egypt. All kinds of Egyptians running around saying how things got to be done. 
because they can do it in Egypt. But what works in Egypt don't work in God's kingdom. A lot of people had a lot of experience, walk around with a lot of pride, a lot of, I did this in Egypt, I did this in Egypt. Moses shows up with his own mentality. He was going to become the lone crusader of righteousness. He thought working within the auspices of Egyptian leadership, he was going to bring about change. Egypt gave him the platform of notoriety. He, he would sway the opinion of the people because Egypt had raised him to be a mighty Egyptian. He would be a warrior for injustice, if you will. Right from within the culture of Egypt, his plan was to change Egypt. Now, if you ever really thought of it in those terms, it was because he was going to try to use his position in Egypt as a prince of Egypt to liberate his people from bondage. Moses had his own ideas. Moses had his own agenda. I'll be on one, one of the things that I learned from my wife real quickly. She's got this saying, I plan and God laughs. You know, I, I, what's funny is that you can plan, but you better be willing to allow God to change those plans. I ain't never seen someone stuck as so stubborn as they just won't yield to God. I'm sure Moses has thought, I can bring victory to my people here in Egypt. You have to remember, Egypt raised him. Egypt educated him and trained him. It's possible that his vision of the future probably involved a liberated Hebrew people that would remain a functioning part of Egyptian society. Are you still with me? But there was one fatal flaw. Moses, as an Egyptian, that may have been your idea, but that was not God's plan. God had used Egypt to preserve and provide for his people in a time of famine. God had protected his people in Egypt. He used Egypt to multiply the seed of Abraham. You have to understand, you know the story of Israel. They only had a few that went in, but millions were coming out. He used Egypt to produce a people who would number as many as the sands of the seashore. But their inheritance was never in Egypt. Your inheritance is not in the world. Oh, hear what I'm saying to you. Their promised land was not in Egypt. Your promises are in Egypt. You can point to this and point to that, but that's not an inheritance. Uh, you have to say the only way for Moses to ever understand that was to separate himself from Egypt. As long as he was in Egypt, as long as he had the mindset of Egypt, he would be confused. Because you can't serve God and the world. You can't serve two masters. I know you try. I watch some of my most favorite people. I watch some of the best people that could be powerful try. You can't do it. Moses couldn't do it. You and I can't do it. So when he came of age, circumstances conspired to make him an outcast. God said, okay, I'm going to use you against you to get you where I need you. Man, I don't know about you. I can't, I can't believe how many times I did something dumb and God turned around. And I, I, that's all right, son. Come on. The devil got you right where I want you. He had a passion for social justice. Mm -hmm. And it overruled his sense of righteousness. We know that in a fit of anger, he became guilty of murder. Oh, I, I'm going to help this thing go forward. And then he kills, kills, kills somebody. Look, you never get any brighter by blowing somebody else's candle out. You see, he was trying to do God's will in an Egyptian way. Oh, I hope I'm, I'm, hope I'm getting through to somebody today. 
you can't do for God in a worldly way. At some place, you're going to have to find that powerful place called surrender. So after that fatal error, anybody ever made mistakes? He probably thought his whole world had fallen apart, but the truth is that when he fled, listen, when he fled Egypt, he was finally running right into God's plan. When he fled Egypt, when, when he fled and finally ran for his life, he was running right into the plan and the purpose of God for his life. God used his, see, Egypt can't do that, but God can. God used his mistake to get him not walking, but running in the right direction. How many wants to speed up the will of God in your life? <laughs> the influence of Egypt in your life will always hinder the plan and purpose that God has for you. The more enamored you become with the things of this world, the more centered you are on the stuff of Egypt, the more that you feel that you got to have this and you got to have that, the more distant you will become from the calling and the purposes of God in your life. Until you let go of those Egyptian honors, you can't really honor God. When Moses turns his back on Egypt, then and only then does God begin to develop the man that will fulfill the purpose and the plan of God. While noble as it is that you want to help and deliver people, you can't do it until you do it God's way. Years later, when we read of the liberation of the Hebrews, it is not the military training or the education of the Egyptians that facilitates Moses' role in the liberating of God's people. It was the divine anointing of God that produced him right. When he submitted himself, and got as far away from Egypt as possible, that he finally found that place where he could be who God called him to be. You see, accolades from your peer group can't do it. Wealth can't buy it. Success cannot secure it. Notoriety will not bring it about. It was God that drove him out of Egypt. Can I tell you something? It sounds painful. It sounds contrary. It sounds far out. But if you could just let God get your mindset, get your heart away from the things of the world, out of Egypt, God could get you into his place of deliverance. It was God who physically separated him from the corrupting influence of Egypt. You have to understand what influences you controls you. The fact that he decided, I'm not an Egyptian, standing in the middle of Egypt was the beginning of his deliverance. The fact that all of a sudden he wanted to do something. The fact that it was there. I can tell you right now, the desire, the, des the desire in your heart is the promise that the destination is there. But you've got to allow the desire to help you become obedient to God and obstinate. Let me get right down to where we're living this morning. You are not made for this world. Remember back in the garden when everything got tore up and messed up? We're suffering from that. God's trying to get you back. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God did not ordain your life so that you could be swallowed up in the things, the stuff, the ways, or the bondage of this world's way of living. You can have a home here. You can have a mansion here. But don't let that confuse you or distract you that Egypt's not your home. Yeah. Too many have built a house where you should have pitched a tent. God may have used, and there's another message here I'm going to try to avoid get into, this world and some of the things of it to nurture you. He may have used this world to preserve you. Thank God for a good job. But what is a good job if you're lost for eternity? Remember what the job's for. Thank God you got your health. There, you know what? One of the most tragic things to see a, ba a young baby die cancer. So if you're here and you're over 40, you cr you're crying because you didn't get this. Well, I want to do this one thing before I go. And we got little bait. 
Sometimes we forget our perspective. God's enabled you to have some nice things. He has used this world to bless you in a plethora of ways. And I've come to do what most pastors won't do. I come to sound the warning. I'm not, I'm not coming to give you some psychological babble make you feel so good about yourself that you leave here and don't change nothing. I'm not trying to get you caught up in emotionalism. I know how to do that. You go find us on YouTube. I got a few sermons I can do that. I'm not trying to do that for anybody in here. I'm trying to get you to make conscious decisions yes. that you just decide, I must be saved. Yes. And to say this, I'm not an Egyptian. Nobody, I don't care who you are, can look at that world today and go, oh, that's a great place. Nobody. Man has had his hands on it too long without submitting to God that it's a mess. I don't care who arises up in politics or goes down. Ain't none of them can fix it, but I know God can. Don't make the mistake of settling for this world. Don't make the mistake for thinking because you got a few things that you got it made. Don't, don't, whatever you do, don't make the mistake of putting the things of this life, the material stuff that you've been blessed with ahead of God's calling for you and your purpose. Don't ever confuse that you can lay your hands and take thine ease because you got Egypt. If you settle for this world, I come to tell someone you're settling way below your potential. The things that may have captivated you are shallow. It's going to be so silly for some people when they look and see what kept them from the will of God, what kept them from the powerful purpose of God, what kept them from what they could have done in God because of a few trinkets and trivial things of this world. I know this kind of conversation is for, and I'm not telling you don't go work a job. I'm not telling you. I'm saying do all that but so that you can be involved in what God's doing. Because ultimately, the whole thing's what God is doing. He's separating the sheep from the goats. He's allowing this. So against the backdrop of eternity, all those things that you think are important, that you spend your life on, that you spend your finances on, are kind of going to be looking pretty pathetic. Hey, wooden stubble, can I call it that? That's a biblical term, if you don't know. Let me ask this. Anybody value God's knowledge? Anyone here value God's word? Here is the choice of words he used to those who think for more things of the world or Egypt than to pursue the things of God. Are you ready? Luke 12, verse 20. Thou fool. Fool. Can you imagine... Seeking more of Egypt. Can you imagine sitting here today? And let's say you got maybe a week, maybe five, 10, 20, 30 years. And you want more of that. And you don't even know him. Thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Oh, yeah, you did it. You did it, Moses. You had all that stuff. But so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That place where we just won't surrender to what we know is true. We just won't surrender to God because we want to let God know this is my own life. This I'm going to do what I want to do. And I get that. And that's that that's something that is enamored all. Why would I submit or surrender myself to God? The best this world has to offer will burn with fervent heat one of these days. All the beauty you ladies have is going to fade. Man, those jobs that you identify with to try to get accolades, they're going to change. And the approval of this world that's fickle and fleeting will be gone. Can I ask you in all reality, do you really think eternity is going to put up in lights your accomplishments? <laughs> Are they going to have a special place for your accolades? Are they really going to bring the pathetic grandeur of a lost world into heaven? 
The only thing of value in this life is what God has called you to do and to be. We know Moses because he did what God wanted him to do. We know about Moses. We know about these people in the Bible. We know about these people. And they're still digging up their, their history and their, today. Moses may see himself as a cultural savior, as a cultural crusader working within the system of Egypt, but God had a bigger and greater plan beyond anything Moses could imagine. Listen to me, God wants to use you. He has a divine purpose for something greater. If the greatest thing is, is something in the world, you miss God. Egypt cannot produce the man or woman that God has called you to be. Egypt cannot grant you the anointing that you must have to do what God has for you to do at some point if you're going to really achieve your purpose. If heaven, that great cloud of witness, is really going to stand back and watch you accomplish God's will, you have to turn your back on Egypt. At some point, you're going to have to turn away from the corrupting influence and mindset of this world. Moses, as wonderful as everyone thinks you are, even though everybody in Egypt knows who you are, as you ride around in your chariot, as you ride around looking like a big shot, as you ride around, everybody knows with all the Egyptian resources at your disposal, with all your talents and abilities, as important as you think it all is, God will not use you as you are. You're not going to hear this anywhere else. You're not. You see, this world is ready for revival in the things of God. Uh, that may not light your fire. I, I get that. I understand. But th th this, 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 this world, just like Egypt, is a whole nation. That, that needs liberated. There was a people that were locked down. There were people that were enslaved. There were people that were being hurt. There were people that would be treated like garbage and they need liberated. But the liberator, the deliverer that God was raising up, the deliverer, the man that God was sending was bogged down and caught up in the influence of Egypt. He was an Egyptian that God called to be a Hebrew. How can God use you when you're surrounded with the opulence of Egypt, because it affects the way you think. The world affects the way you see things, and sadly, it even becomes a part of who you are. You cannot separate you from what you actually do. So God says, come out of Egypt, Moses. Separate yourself unto me. Now, you know I'm not talking about just Moses today. 2 Corinthians 6, 11 through 18 in the ESV, English Standard Version says, we have spoken freely to you. Paul is speaking. Paul's salvation and, and, and transformation is on par with, with Moses. Listen to what he says. Corinthians, our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Is this talking to anybody today why you're, why you're not doing what God has called you to do? In return, I speak as to children. Widen your hearts. Open your hearts also. The temple of the living God. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God? with idols. You're the temple of God. How do you have idols in your life? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God. This is in the New Testament. This is after the book of Acts. This is after the plan of salvation. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing and I will welcome you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. God has a plan for you. God has something greater for you and there may be just one person here that gets this, but I'll tell you what, I'll preach this for one. I'll leave the 99 for one today. Some of you may just sweep this aside and not change a thing. 
Listen, Paul is telling the Corinthians a message of the New Testament. It is the same message of the Old Testament. God is holy, and he's looking for a people willing to strive to be holy. Remember, Paul was a product of a culture. You see, Israel needed delivered from Egypt. And then now, in Paul's time, Israel needed delivered from Rome, both places that were prominent with power. Paul was a product of culture like Moses and politics and opulence of that day. He had everything. He, he had all the education, all the talent, all the finances and resources at his fingertips. Yes. And like Moses, he too could not be used as a Roman. God had to get him out of that, give him a Damascus experience and change what he valued, change what he pursued, change what made him a man. God could not use Moses while in Egypt was in his heart. God could not use Paul while Rome was in his heart. And God will not use the likes of you and I while the world takes up prominent residence in our heart. It's not a popular message today. I'm not going to win any friends in here probably, but it's still true. It's still real. He's called his people to come out. Why do we read about the disciples? Why do we read about these people? Why, why do some of you run to the polls? They're going to vote for them. They're going to change. They're going to change. Can I let you a secret? Right wing, left wing, same bird. If you read the history of politics, they create the problems that they tell you they're going to solve. So I want to talk about politics because I know who the real problem solver is. I'm not going to waste my time talking about politics. They're not going to fix it. But I can trust Jesus to fix me. I can trust Jesus to save me. It doesn't matter what the whole world does. I'm going to surrender to God today. Listen, I know separation. I know this message won't draw a crowd. A bloody cross that you have to carry. You know your Bible tells, Jesus tells to carry it. It's not going to get a lot of people jumping up and down. Oh, I can't wait. You see, that kind of preaching doesn't attract those whose hearts filled with Egypt. Preach it, Pastor. Come on. It's an old song. I wish we sang it. We don't sing it anymore. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. If you can sing it, help me. The emblem of suffering and shame. Nobody wants that. Carry it. Jesus carried a cross. And he said, if you will follow after me, take up your cross. Yes. Nobody preaches that today. I don't want you to leave here, ha me having lied to you, thinking you can just keep on running around with Egypt. and still Being a believer and being a follower are two different things. He, he said in that day, many will come to me, you've done many great work, things in your name. I didn't know you. How does that happen? That scares me. That may not scare you. It scares me. You cannot serve God in Egypt. And some take offense when they're told about what you got to give up. I hear it all the time. It's not a sin. I get that. So let, let's, let's, let's flip the honesty here. Let me put it in another way. Keep removing stuff in your life until you get to where you know you're supposed to be in God. Isn't it funny? How we were so, I'm okay, I'm okay. I, wait a minute, no, it's not about, are you right with God? When's the last time you heard him speak to you? When's the last time he used you? When's the last time you know, God used me? We're all about God has blessed me. Are you sure it was God and not the fact that you just live in America? <laughs> Oh, God being so good to me. You sure? What have you? Well, wait a minute. I'm sorry to bring up an old lady song. What have you done for me lately? Uh, if we're to be the bride of Christ, shouldn't we be separated under the groom? 
Let me get back in my notes. Let me let me show you. Let me show you how how simple it is. Let me show you how simple it is, which is great if you're ready, but an indictment if you're not. If you're like that rich young ruler, and you're going to walk away sad, or you're like the rich fool who's not even God. Draw nigh to God. That's wonderful, but it's better than that. And He will draw nigh to you. I don't even know if there's a God anymore. I ain't felt God. I ain't felt God in so long. Well, when's the last time you drew close to Him? When's the last time you? When's the last time you put away all that junk and all that stuff and all those thoughts and all those things and all your complaint and all your criticism and all the things that you point out and find yourself and just, God, I'm so thankful. You love me. I want to praise you. I just want to love you back. I don't want to ask for anything. I just want to let you know I love you. I want to surrender to you. Not my will, but thy will be done. Let me lay down Egypt so I can seek the kingdom. Because you didn't just stop there with the draw nigh stuff. You know what it says next? It's painful. Y'all ready? There's this church today. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Look at your neighbor. See, you sinner, clean your hands. Tell your neighbor, hey, sinner, clean your hands. Just think about it. Is whatever it is worth losing out with God? Let me put in this perspective. Come on, ladies. Come on, come on. Some some of us have had some relationship issues. You, you, ever, you, ever, you ever meet the person they left you for? What? Well, you thought I was just gonna be all rainbows and roses in here? Anybody ever been sold a bill of goods? You a bunch of bunch of lies? I gave up. I gave up all this peace and tranquility for your mess. There's some things that if we would just allow God, if we just surrender them, clean my hand. I want to wash my hands of it. Yeah. I'm yeah. tired of it. It's taken yeah. too much of my life and my vitality. It's taken my thoughts. It's taken my time. Every I get up, it's on my mind. I go to bed, it's on my mind. I'm drinking. And I even had I haven't had a godly dream or a godly thought. I haven't done anything God. I've let it engulf my life. Time to wash my hands of it. It wasn't until he washed Egypt off his hands that Moses could do something for God. And he goes and says, "Purify your hearts." Just getting it off your hands ain't one thing. You got to get it out of your heart. Come on, some of you broken-hearted piece of God. And mend a broken heart, but you got to give them all the pieces. Problem with some of you, you fell in love with the things of Egypt, so you can't fall in love with God until you give God all. Well, purify your, purify your heart. You know what he calls someone that's dumb minded? Dumb minded. But we already know you can't serve. Draw close to God. He'll draw close to you. Let me tell you something. If you got to go home to an empty house or a brutal house, I promise you, I promise you, if you will find that place and get down and just start talking to God, I promise you, he'll talk to God. He'll talk right back to you. If you just talk to God, he'll talk to you. If you just talk to God, he'll, I promise you, if you'll eliminate everything and start letting things and getting things out of y'all, clean it out until you know you're close to God. Don't stop getting rid of junk or the unnecessary things until you get there. Because ain't nothing you get rid of going to be worth losing your soul over. You know, the word and the term and the divorce is an ugly thing. It violently rips apart the very fabric of marriage. It violently violates something that was once inseparably joined together. The results are painful, they're tragic, they're brutal. The, the imagery of divorce carries all kinds of negative connotations. But understand, there came a time and place in the life of Moses where he had to physically separate from Egypt. There comes a time, even if 
even though you've dr you've tied yourself to it emotionally, that you got to rip yourself apart from it so that you can really love there comes a place in life for every person that God uses greatly where you must abandon your pursuit of this world and Egypt and draw nigh to God. That place where you start really focusing solely on the will and the purpose of God for your life. Moses, when he became of age, refused, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh. Can you imagine that? What are you known for? Oh, that's that's Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, that's 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 Pharaoh's son. Um, whatever. There's just something. I'm not an Egyptian. Hey, man, we we so want to be associated with our jobs. You know what? That's how I used to say it when I worked for Intel and did electronics. Look, I got to come in and do electronics for eight, sixteen hours a day, depending on what's going on. But I'm God's 24 hours a day. I'm God's. You have to understand, there's a difference. It's the only reason I'm here today, the only reason I got here today is because I had a mindset that I know I've got to do that for a period of time. I know I've got to be there, and I'm going to do the best I can do while I'm there. But understand, I'm not going to violate my Christian tenets because I'm there. Why? I'm not an Egyptian. You ought, you ought to be on the job and say, man, how come, how come you don't cast? How come you don't... I'm not, I'm not an Egyptian. I, 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 I live in this world, but I'm not of this world. How come you're not buying this? How come you're not buying this? You know what? I, I'm passing through, man. The carnality of this world is not your friend. John 2 and 16 says, for all that is in the world, that even includes the things that you think are so important, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. This world and all of its, I, I want to put it in this context, in all its ways are at war with the purpose of God in your life. Egypt was at war with what God wanted to do with Moses. Egypt was at war. Can you imagine the struggle of this young man being raised up, watching this people in the mud pits, watching these slaves, and here he is with a full belly, a full wallet, a bank account, all the things that was, I'd rather be with them. You see, the world is at war with the bride of Christ today. This world is at war with the church. Why do you think there's so much hate for the church today? Why do you think there's so much? You're not allowed to do that here. You're not allowed to do that. Well, we're going to bring all this other junk into the schools, but we're not letting God in. Y'all better, better wake up. Y'all better wake up to what's happening. Sometimes I feel better without these done things. I got to look at you, make sure y'all. Can I tell you, this world hates what God loves. This world, just because you got some stuff don't mean the world loves you. How do you know it ain't tricked you and wooed you like cheese in a trap for a mouth? There's a reason that cheese is free. This world is at war with your relationship with God. You may call the truth, but God sitting back there, that's not what I wanted for you. The world, that stuff, those things, that mindset, that culture, all its trappings are trying to cause you to cheat on your relationship with God. We live in a world today of Christianity where everything's okay. Then why is he calling us out? Why is he telling us to be separate? Why is he telling us, look, you can't serve God? And man. You can't, you, what, why does he say that but every church, oh, you're okay? I believe come as you are, but I've never seen God leave them as they found them. So you're telling me right now that we got all these kids running around here and, and some of them ain't got parents and some of them got nothing to eat and some of them, oh, they're okay. That's why we gave backpacks. We're not happy. We'll just leave them as, as we found them. Let's make things better. You see, because the enemy knows that what we think are small compromises. What you, what you think no one notices, the things that you play with, the things that consume your heart and your mind, the, the things that you think you're getting away with. The enemy sits back like this. Because you know what God likes to do with people that are doing good? Satan's walking around so you can mess with, uh, hey, have you considered my servant Job? 
Can you imagine living so good for God? Say, hey, man, check him out, devil. How many, how many, how many people we got in here that are God's? Until, in, until your spirit is divorced from this world, the world is going to take you apart. God's purpose cannot be brought to pass in your life. Listen to me. You are, it's basically dying a slow death. And you don't even realize it. In ancient Asia, they had a thing they called death by a thousand cuts. Anybody old enough to remember that? It was a form of torture, corporal punishment. They didn't just thrust you through and you die and it's over. Slow death, almost imperceptive at first. And they slowly and methodically, one tiny cut after another, which at first, ah, but they still become fatal. The scary thing is, you don't feel it at first. It doesn't trigger that fight or flight. Some of us have been dying by a thousand cuts. We never thought we needed to run from something we have because we don't realize that it's slowly robbing our spiritual life. You, you can keep telling yourself, oh, I'm okay. You can tell yourself these small things in your life don't really matter, but listen to me. Fleshly lust, war against your soul. First Peter 2.11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, remember, people with tents, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. What's the date today? I'm going to bring this to close pretty quick. We're a little over a month away from the anniversary of 9-11. We all met. See, I, I had to get the kids out of here because everybody was like, what are you talking about? On September 11th, 2001, the United States of America was awakened to the fact that we were engaged in a war that a majority of Americans were not even aware of. That wasn't a sneak attack. They'd been warning us. I could show you in this. They'd been warning us. And they finally did what they said they're going to do. And everybody's freaking out. Hey, saying to God, you're at war. You're at war. Just in case it slipped your mind, understand the theme of thief cometh not but for to seal, to kill, and to destroy. He hasn't changed what he's trying to do to you. The big, the big things you know, are you dying of a thousand cups and you don't realize, have you become, have you been rendered useless? Have you been, have you been eliminated from the fight? Have you been eliminated because you've just sur surrendered to the world instead of surrendered to God? You can't see it. You can't feel it. But some of you right now are locked in the battle of your soul right now against an enemy that wants to rob you out of eternity and your eternal life. It wants to break you away from everything that is godly. Now, why do you think there is such a struggle for morality today in this world? Why do you think all this craziness and ridiculous is going on? We, we got young teenage boys beating up old women. We've got shootings. We got, wait a minute. Our world is getting farther away from God and get it worse. Does that not tell you what's going on? The tragedy or the sinister thing of it all is every human being was fearfully and wonderfully made for the purpose of God. And they don't realize they're losing the war for their soul. Look what God did to help Moses. He redirected him. God took Moses from Egypt to the backside of a desert. Nobody, nobody wants to be there. He took him from the palace to the sheepfold, from being a prince to being a humble sheep herder. That's a change. That's a radical change. That, that looks like, man, I'm going downhill here. My life's messed up. No, 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 no. You see, the distance from Egypt and all its attractions to the backside of the desert is how far it is from where this world is taking you to where God needs you to be. Are you hearing me? There's something significant about the backside of the desert. There's something about getting away from all the distractions. There's something about separating yourself. Even Jesus, when a stone's throw, he went a little further, the Bible says, to get away from the pomp and circumstance, the distractions of this guy and that person. There's something about getting away and away, getting away from Egypt, separating from 
the twangs, the passion. Listen, I understand coming to Sunday morning church is good, but I'll tell you what, coming Sunday night is going to help you get closer to God. Coming Wednesday, I'm telling you, the closer you get to God, the further you're going to get away from Egypt. Out of the way of all the influences that draws you away from a close walk with God. Oh, I want God in my home. Then get close to God. You see out where there are no bright lights or colors. Where the glitter of gold fades and the sparkles of jewels cannot be seen. It's just Moses and God. Even though it took 40 years for God to get Moses to that place where he needs to be. You know what I'm really talking about starts at an altar. Amen, and it isn't accomplished in a day. That's our problem. I can't give you a pill. I'm not going to tell you to turn around three times, put money in the offering and everything's, it's not true. Just coming here and shaking my hand, that's not going to fix it. Just coming on a Sunday morning, I mean, it's as important, it's not going to fix it. But I tell you what, if you're here tonight, if you're here Wednesday, if you're in life groups on Thursday, and if you repeat it day in, day out, and you get up in the morning and you pray and you read your Bible, I promise you, I, pro I can promise you that life will start shifting, that God will get closer to you. Quick fixes don't work. Winning the lottery has caused people more problems than it's helped them. Go do the research. Only thing money, people think, people take that script out of con, money answers all things. No, money tells you where your heart is. That's what that means. we got to stop compromising. Holiness can't be spoken into existence. And it takes more than shallow platitudes and passionate promises on a Sunday night. Holiness is something that has to be lived daily. It takes a daily walk. And a daily commitment that, you know, I'm just going to live and draw closer to God. I'm just going to strive to get closer. I'm just going to start eliminate some things. I used to say words like this I'm not going to say anymore. I used to go places like that I'm not going to go anymore. It's so funny that when I, when, I, when I started living for God and I quit doing the things that I was doing, I, would, I, I walked into my family's house one, one Christmas season, and I come in there, and I wasn't drinking with them, and I stopped cussing, I stopped doing all that. And then someone got all mad and said, we liked it better when you weren't serving God. You know what they said? Can I can I add? We liked it better when you were on the expressway to hell. Really? They weren't looking out for me. Let me tell you what I really think 2022 is really all about. All this civil unrest, all this ridiculousness that's going. Can I tell you that six thousand years ago there was male and female, and if God tarries. 6,000 years from now, they're still just going to be male and female. That's right. In fact, if they dig you up 6,000 years from now, they're going to grab your bones, grab your DNA, and tell you whether you're a man or a woman. That's funny. We teach biology in schools, but yet they're going to... You want to be a part of that craziness? I'm not buying into that craziness. I'm not doing it. I think, I, I think what's going on right now is God is giving the church an opportunity to turn again. To be like Moses and turn aside. God is vying attention for his bride, for his church. I, I think it's about stripping away all the fake and the phonies. Can I, can, I, can I say this in church today? It's time for, if you'll go call me in here and call yourself something at church, then bless God, you need to be that when you're not here. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, we got some people in here that we promote, that we lift up. Let me tell you something. When you leave here, be the same thing. Be the same thing. The world, the lost world deserves a real church. Stop playing games. Stop fooling around. Stop going it and talking one way out there than coming in here. Have a godly home that you can invite your neighbor to, to a meal. You're not condemning what they're doing. You're showing a better way. If all you do is brag about all the worldly stuff you got and you never talk about God, you're defeating the purpose. You're, you're becoming a front to God. 
If all you talk about is how good God been to you and you ain't doing what makes you good to God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hidden in the calamity of all this chaos in Moses' life, there was still a voice of God that's echoing across the landscape of modern life, crying out. You see, Noah had an ark. We got the church. All of Egypt and all that it had could never get Moses to where he needed to be. Egypt couldn't prepare him. God did. And I believe God is calling this church and you people right now to separate yourself. Say, you know what? I'm tired of that. Let me focus on God. Let, let, me, let me spiritualize this today. The burning bush didn't burn away the bush. The bush was on fire, but the bush wasn't consumed. That's a foreshadowing of the plan of salvation today. The Shekinah glory of God began to burn in the midst of a desert in a bush. Before Moses can accomplish his purpose, he has to first catch a glimpse of the glory of God. God is going to send Moses back to Egypt, but what he sees on this day in the desert will serve as a counterbalance against anything Egypt has to offer. Can I tell you in the house of God, God wants to show you his glory because what you've seen and experienced his fire, what you've seen and experienced his Holy Ghost and his power, all those attract, when you really get it, when you really get the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden, all the things of this earth will go slow. We're not, not you people that let it, the fire go out. I'm talking about on fire, doing high water, the real problem. Through sickness and health, I'm talking about I'm married to Jesus no matter how ugly it gets. I'm talking about an apostolic church and apostolic people that I don't care if no one's shouting, I'll shout. I don't care if nobody else is living godly, I'm going to live godly. God knows we need some real holy rollers again. All those things in this world pale. You'll never get there until you first turn your back on Egypt. That's right. Fire in Scripture, and I know i got to close, Jesus. is a symbol of divine judgment. It is the active agent of holiness of God consuming that which is evil. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Fire. In the last days, God will make a new heaven and earth, and the old will be consumed by fire. Everything that you think is so important, God's just going to put it in the. You better think about what you value. Think about Elijah on Mount Carmel. God that answered by fire. God doesn't just show Moses the fire of his judgment. God showed him a bush that is being consumed, being burning, but it's not being consumed. It's burning, but it's not being destroyed. That's the miracle of this moment. You have to understand what's happening here. The glory of a holy God is about to settle upon him. And though he's a man of flesh and blood, the fire of God will not destroy him. Make no mistake, he, he may be consumed, but he will not be destroyed. That's the power of the Holy Ghost today. That's why we need the whole, that's why every saint of God, every, that's why Jesus told Nicodemus, except you're born of the water and spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. That's why in Acts 19, when those disciples came, they, the disciple asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost? We haven't so much as heard. You see, you see, I can tell you what separates this church from so many others. They're not going to tell you about the Holy Ghost. They're not going to tell you about the fire. You say, Moses, my fire will consume you, but it won't destroy you. That's the invitation we all need. See, 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 see. God will not settle for just part of you. 
That's the problem. You just want that part-time lover. Come on, I was raised in the 80s. God wants you to be led of the Spirit. So when you really get the Spirit, it will consume you. Or he will not invest in you. The whole bush is about to become engulfed in flame. What do you think happened on the day of Pentecost? What do you think the tongues of fire were all about? That upper room, that was his church. Those were the people. He told 500 people to go to the upper room. How many know who? how many went? When God poured out of his spirit upon humanity, it was the holiness of God that consumed the frailness of humanity. And instead of death, it, it, it produced eternal life. Amazing, anointed life. When's the last time you caught on fire? When's the last time you got excited about the things of God? Hey, anybody ever bought a new car? It's exciting. But in two weeks, a month, six months, then payments are killing you and the enthusiasm gone. You see, I want to be a product of the upper room experience. You see, it wasn't just power and authority. It was the overshadowing and the holiness of God. Not, not man's holiness, God's holiness. See, when you're on fire and you're doing the things of God, it's more than long sleeves and, and a clean mouth. It's living for God and shining its lights in the darkness. Holiness will not mix with your worldliness. That's the significance of the burning bush. Moses is about to be consumed with a singular passion for life. Moses in Egypt had everything. Moses and God did one thing. <laughs> and I tell you, it's worth leaving Egypt behind. But he had to do one thing. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, do not draw near this place. Wait a minute, you just called me. Well, hold on. I did, but there's a part of you that ain't coming. It's time to surrender and take your shoes off. This is holy. The unholy can't come. I got fire for you, but you got to leave them shoes behind because I'm about to, holiness means separate. I'm about to separate you. I'm going to separate you from everything. See, see, shoes back in that day were important. Not everybody had shoes. Shoes were important. Your shoes represented who you were and what you did. Men, that's our problem. It's about who we think we are and what we think that makes it. God is saying, no, you're going to leave that out, Moses. Uh, you ain't, you, you're not coming into my holiness with who you are because you're going to leave that behind and become who I want you to be. Mm. Holiness is not simply righteousness, although that's a part. Holiness also means oneness. Holiness binds you to God. Holiness connects you to God. Holiness is not a bad word. Holiness is the very character and nature of God. And it's the spirit that he puts inside you. That's why it's so important to get the Holy Ghost. Because watch this. As Moses draws near to God, God stops him. Think about it. Without a doubt, this is exactly what God wanted. He wanted Moses to be attracted to and draw near to his holiness. But he stops him because before Moses steps into the holiness of God, there has to be a change in him. Take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. But the the ground represents all the substance and the things of this world by its very nature it's the dirt it's not holy the world is unholy you're going to leave Egypt behind the shoes they represented where you've been what you've been doing and who you've been they represent your effort take off your effort because now it's going to take mine Listen to me. God's holiness will not mix with your version of holiness. God's holiness. If, if you really, really aspired to God being holy, you wouldn't be jumping up and down, going to the bathroom, going here, going there in this church. You wouldn't just not worry about what time you came to church. You mean, I'm going to be there for prayer. 
when you start reverencing that's holy, it changes you. Can I get an amen from someone who's God's changing you? Can I get an amen from someone who, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You see, this goes back to Cain and Abel. God demands proper and obedient worship, not just any worship. I know they tell you, I know, just come as you are, worship how you want. Wait a minute. He literally turned someone away for improper worship. You don't come to God on your own terms. You may come as you are, but you come on his terms. God tells Moses, you need to take shoes off. You're not going to walk around with your version of righteousness. You're going to walk in mine. You're not going to go up to the mountain and get tablets of the law that are inscribed with how you think things should be. You're going to live by my law. You're not going to be clothed with your own version of holiness. You're going to be clothed with mine. God was saying, this is the pivotal moment for Moses. If he doesn't surrender his shoes, he never walks in the purpose of God. There's someone here today. Let's stand. There's someone here today. You've been thinking about God. You've been talking about God. You've been wanting a closer with God. There's so many today. You, you've been waffling with your walk with God. It's bothered you. But change is hard. We get stuck being who we are. Sometimes we get all caught up in our idea of holiness and our idea of who God is. And we think we can determine ourselves that we can construct our own holiness. Isn't that what Adam and Eve did? We'll cover ourselves how we want. God, don't know you won't. We think we have enough spiritual discernment to judge for ourselves between right and wrong. We think we know enough that we can just do God's will without getting it from God. God's saying, surrender your shoes. You see, the world's going to tell you, oh, just make your own way. In fact, Oprah will tell you, oh, there's all these way to God. It's funny, his word don't say that. It doesn't say that one time. Now, I get it. I understand the idea if we want everybody to feel included. I get that. I'm not, God's not opposing it. He, 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 but you got to tell him the truth. It's not a coincidence that that whole mentality of today's world sounds a whole lot like the dialogue of Satan before he got thrown out of heaven. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to make myself. I'm going to surrender the pretense of your version of righteousness and recognize there's none holy but God. The removal of those shoes was a type of confession that even my very best attempt to live righteous and holy on my own is nothing more than filthy rags in the presence of a holy God. It's an act of worship. It's an act of surrender. It's an act of submission. That first step towards the formation of God's will in your life. One of these days, every one of us is going to stand before the judge of the whole earth. Can I tell you what won't be heard that day? Oh God, I just didn't see it that way. That didn't make sense to me. Hold up, Lord. I ain't seeing it that. Well, God, I just want to tell you, my way's better than yours. Wait a minute. Anybody ever taken a car into a dealership to get fixed? Do me a favor. When you take it in there, say, listen, just get out of my way. I'm going to use your tools. I fix this by myself. <laughs> You're not going to do that when it comes to a car. Are you really going to take yourself out of the hands of God and save yourself? You, you're going to take your own self to heaven? Ephesians tells us Paul and his benevolence and his love talking to people. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord. Listen, he's, being, he's imploring people that ye henceforth, or from here on, 
Don't walk as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. You ever seen the vanity in the world today? Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart? Hey, folks. As Moses surrendered his shoes, so we must surrender. In Acts chapter 2, they were told to go to the upper room. And the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one court in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house. where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. Amen. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. That's why Jesus went to Calvary. You see, I, I, I spoke about this the other day. Don't just come for the blood and the cross. Just don't come to Calvary. You need to go all the way to the upper room. Don't just come for the blood and the cross. You need the Holy Ghost. I, I, the, the world don't want to talk about that because they want control over you. See, they'll get you with your emotions, but your emotions will deceive you. They'll preach flowery sermons. You know, and I, I, I can do that. I've done that. But in all tenses, I want to tell someone that I don't know who, who, who it is today. You need to get the Holy Ghost evidence of speaking in tongues. You need the fire. Yes. And the only way you're going to get the fire, you're going to have to take off your past. You're going to have to take off your shoes. Okay. Not my will, but thy will be. If, even if you've been around this thing a hundred years, if you haven't yielded yourself to the things of God, if you've not surrendered yourself to God, if you have not returned yourself to that powerful place called surrender, I invite you today. <laughs> 